Coming up, a sounding rocket creates a light show. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I have an interview with Jim Cantrell talking about the history of future space. And I close out the show once again. All that and more on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. And welcome to Orbit 10, episode 24. 24, I actually had to double check. 24, I can't believe we're, we're that far into this seat, this orbit. <laughs> this is so crazy, you guys. Um, I'm, I'm Carrie, and I'm speaking with a Jared and a Mike. I also have a Dada, a Ben. Apparently, I also have a Luke and a Jack. I, I didn't even know. And then a little bit later on, I'll go have a Jim as well, which is really fantastic. So we have got a full... Full show, full pack for you guys today. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to our Patreon members. These are the Patreon people of the Escape Velocity variety. They have uh, given us $10 or more for this particular segment, this particular episode. Actually, all segments of the episode, to be fair. Uh, they pay for a lot of things around here, and they get our utmost gratitude. So thank you for all of these people. And of course, if you would also like to get your name in the show, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Oh my goodness. Whew. All right, so as we like to also start off the top of the show, we want to make sure that we look at the launches of the last week, and uh, we had at least two, and this week is yes. going to be uh, <laughs> no less busy than that. So, Mike, why don't you go ahead and start us off? What happened last week in launches? Oh, man. So uh, this the first launch that we had last week was actually on Sunday, and this was the kind of second part of SpaceX's doubleheader, <laughs> two launches in two days. Whew. And this was the one from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So let's first off go, go ahead and check out the footage, and then For we'll sure. talk about it. Four, three, two, one. Lift off the Falcon 9. Prop AVI RC. So as I said, this Falcon 9 launched on Sunday, June 25th at 2025 Coordinated Universal Time from Space Launch Complex Number 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The launch featured up upgraded grid fins on the first stage that were made of titanium instead of shielded aluminum, which helped to, to steer the vehicle. And the first stage was successfully able to land on the Pacific drone ship, just read the instructions with great footage. I was so happy that they were able to get this all the way going down. So that was just beautiful for this. And uh, the thing that I really loved about this is that this launch for this uh, was launching 10 of the next generation Iridium Next satellites, numbers 11 through 20. And the first 10 of those Iridium Next satellites launched on January on the same booster that was part of the first part of this doubleheader that launched last Friday from Cape Canaveral, two days prior to this launch. So each satellite eventually uh, was uh, deployed in, 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 in sequence, and each one of these new ones will rendezvous with the old satellites that they're intended to replace. So congratulations. Congratulations to everyone at SpaceX and Iridium for having this successful flight, and hopefully everything goes well with their mission, and the next uh, satellites will be able to launch very soon as well. So, awesome. Very, very cool. cool. And uh, Jared, you actually went up for this one yep. with your parents. This is the first launch that they saw? Is yeah, that this is my parents' first launch that they ever saw. This is my 15th that I went to see. For so, sure. So once, uh, once it got past all of the fog... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it only took about 15 seconds for okay, it to clear good. the fog. Where we, where we were at on Ocean Avenue in Lone Poke, um, it was it was clear except for fog right on the horizon. So. Right, which they, is typical for Vandenberg for sure. Yeah, and they were blown away by it. Yeah? So, as good. most people are at their first launch, they're just like... Oh. Right? So, you know. Good. Because I, I know normally you go up for all of those launches and, mm -hmm. and try to get some footage and what have you, but I know you also said you kind of wanted to just enjoy this with your parents. Yeah, I took time. I took no cameras with me and I just stood there and watched it and, and just enjoyed it and it was great. Good. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so really, I mean, the moral of the story is if you are anywhere near any launch within a safe distance, please go see one yes. because they are amazing. Um, all right. So we had another launch, though, this last week, right, Mike? What's, uh, what's, mm -hmm. what, what else took off? 
<laughs> so yeah, we had another uh, Arion 5 launch, another one of the tandem launches, and let's just go ahead and start rolling the footage. Of course, I love their uh, footage at the, at the beginning, the graphics showing the particular yes. payloads, which in this case, the first one was a shared satellite by Helisat and Inmarsat, and then the second satellite in the payload was another one of the GSATs for ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. Dude. So uh, here's the talk footage. Allumage Vulcan. <laughs> Allumage UAP, décollage. So yes, this Ariane 5 rocket launched on Wednesday, June 28th at 2115 Coordinated Universal Time from the Corot Space Center in French Guiana. And with the, the, the two, the, the shared satellite at the top, it was a Helisat number three and Inmarsat S-E-A-N, or as I like to call it, Sean. And both of these are going to be... Uh, <laughs> I mean, with yep, <laughs> that's what, that's what yep, I call it I too. Mean, uh, That'd be a better acronym instead of uh, just having the letters. Anyway, Helisat is owned by, uh, or is rather based in Greece and Cyprus, while Inmarsat is based in Britain. And uh, they're going to be providing TV and Wi-Fi across the European Union, as well as Africa and parts of the Middle East. And then meanwhile, the Indian uh, GSAT-17 is going to be providing mobile data and weather data across India. So Arion Space had another successful launch with that, and congratulations to uh, everyone involved with that. Very cool. <laughs> For those of you who caught that wiggle, because uh, I didn't realize I was on camera, I was trying to figure out if that was my mic or, <laughs> or Mike's mic that was making all the static. Uh, and that was the very technical way of doing that. So just in case you were wondering. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, well, there's a little bit of that. Uh, so, <laughs> Jeremy, we'll let you talk for a little bit. <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm going to bring Woo! it away. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yes. Oh, yes. said it three times. There yeah. you go. So one of my favorite uh, telescopes here on Earth is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And it's, a, it's an array of these uh, millimeter microwave telescopes. And they recently took an image of Beetlejuice, which is a red supergiant 650 light years away from us. This image was taken by Hubble in 1996, mm -hmm. so it's a little old. So, at, so Alma, as I'll call it, mm -hmm. uh, revisited uh, Betelgeuse and took this incredible image of it here. So significantly higher resolution and some very interesting things in this image right here. And just a little background about Betelgeuse. It is massive. Like I said, it's a red supergiant. It is 12 times more massive than the sun. And if you placed it at the center of our solar system, it would most likely extend out beyond the orbit of Jupiter. So it's about 750 million kilometers in diameter. Now that blob that you see in the image right here is actually not an artifact. That's the bow shock from Betelgeuse traveling through the local gas in its area. So, so you're talking about like the extended part on the one side or the white kind of the extended long. part at about okay. 9 o'clock on Betelgeuse there. That's gotcha. not an artifact that is actually there. Okay. And that's just basically Betelgeuse interacting with the local gas in the interstellar area that it is as it travels through there. Okay. Um, now, just to give you an idea of how difficult this was to do this, um, Betelgeuse is 57 milli arc seconds across. So if you want to compare that to something, the moon is a pretty large object in the sky. Betelgeuse's apparent diameter from us here on Earth is 1 32 thousandth the diameter of the moon. And huh. this is one of the few stars that we can actually look at the surface and resolve that there. Um, now, at the end of its life, Betelgeuse is going to become a supernova. It's going to happen sometime in the next million years. When it does, it'll be as bright as Venus at its brightest, um, which means that it would need to occur either in the fall or winter here on Earth for us to actually see it. And I'm totally jealous of whoever's going to be able to see that. So, because we haven't had a visible <laughs> supernova in our own galaxy in 400 years. So... That's, uh, yeah, that's... It's been a while. So. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I keep looking at that image and it reminds me of a, um, a Pokemon and I can't remember which one and so it's bothering me now. <laughs> I will think of it before the end of the Same show for thing. sure. Sure thing. Yeah, because I think it's, it's a pink one and kind of has like that little like tail on the one tail. side. 
I don't know. I know the entire internet is going to be screaming at me any second now. Uh, so why don't we just keep moving? <laughs> Mike, uh, we have all these different acronyms. Uh, we had an Alma and a Sean, and now we have a Rosa. What's, what's, uh, mm -hmm. what's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> so Rosa is an acronym for the Rollout Solar Array, and it was to um, send up to the International Space Station with the last uh, Dragon cargo mission, and that was recently been deployed. So uh, let's go ahead and check out the footage of that. Uh, this happened on uh, Sunday, June 18th, and the whole point of this is it's an experiment that uh, will test to see uh, this more compact solar array that can be rolled out instead of being the more rigid solar panels, and it's going to test to see how it will change, uh, rather, first of all, to make sure it can collect energy, and see how it changes when the Earth blocks the sun, and put it under a lots of different vibration tests and other physical challenges to determine how strong it is and how durable it is. And with this, the payload was, is remained open for seven days before they retracted it and stowed it back inside of SpaceX's Dragon capsule. But I'm kind of excited to see what the results are of this test. I mean, obviously they had a successful rollout, and I appreciate these different angles of it. Um, but whether or not they were able to get enough solar energy from it and whether or not it passed any of their kind of durability tests they were looking for is set to be seen. So hopefully we'll be able to get that really soon. But I just thought that this was a really cool test, and I'm glad to see uh, things like this, because any ways that we can bring the weight down of satellites just means that we can add more instruments and add more cool stuff and do a lot more cool things in space. So That is really cool. Yeah. I, and this, uh, this footage, I imagine, is sped up. Is that correct? Yes, yes. This is definitely a time-lapse footage. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this footage originally lasted, with the different angles, I mean, the entire rollout uh, took about 30 minutes, but with all these different angles together, we have about four hours of footage here that I sped up to about a minute and a half. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's fair. <laughs> Things take a long time. Things take a long time. They want to be as careful as they can when oh, they're yeah. doing stuff. Mm -hmm. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, it would be cool if it was just like, and there it is. Uh, but it's yeah. right. so there's, there's that. Uh, all right, very cool. Uh, Jared, you've got some super massive black hole. Yes. Another one of these Not stories. just a Muse song um, <laughs> or is, something to freak out Carrie Ann. It's a really good Muse um, song, by the way. Yes, it is. Um, but I'm going to continue on the, the non-visible light optical telescope train um, that I'm chugging <laughs> along on here today, which is that the University of New Mexico has actually released a paper that has a very cool result in it, um, and that is that they have discovered the first supermassive black hole binary. So basically what that means is that it's two supermassive black holes that are close enough to each other that they're actually orbiting around around a point between each other. Now they used what's called the Very Long Baseline Array, which is a collection of 10 radio telescopes across the Western Hemisphere from as far east as Puerto Rico all the way west to Hawaii. So they act as an interferometer and that's basically taking the data from the telescopes and combining them together. And they took data over 12 years. So this was not something that they just like started back in January and you know got the results now. This has been a study that's been mm -hmm. a long time coming. Now these supermassive black holes are about 750 million light years away from us here. And they're in a galaxy that has been beautifully named 0402 plus 379, which is an elliptical galaxy. Now, those two supermassive black holes, they have a combined 15 billion solar masses. So those are, that's, that's some pretty big supermassive black holes. And they're actually <laughs> going to collide uh, sometime in the next several million years. And this image that we have up right here is the uh, radio data from them. And you can see C1 and C2 there, which indicates those are the two black holes uh, with some relativistic jets material in the area near them, basically material that's been flung away from the supermassive black hole just before it reaches the event horizon, because it's so energetic, it can actually get away just before the event horizon. Hmm. So, very cool stuff. We're going to use this uh, to check our models of galactic formation and see how they w work and compare them to what this study has been able to find out. We're also going to be able to use this for models of the eventual collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda, since mil both the Milky Way and Andromeda have supermassive black holes at our respective galactic cores. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to 
look at this and maybe get an idea of how that is going to change the shape and formation of that that super galaxy or Andromeda way or the Milk Andromeda or something. I I don't think we have an official name for the combined galaxy. We yet, should start working on that now. I feel yeah, like. we should. We've only got four to five billion years. Right. So. But then that way it's like we can go back and yeah, say, it's set and ready in to the history go, books. So. That's what it said. We should name it. Yeah. We're gonna go with that then. Absolutely. We could Sounds always like just... a plan to me. Let's just get it over with and just get it going. So. <laughs> Uh, that's that's so funny. And the other funny thing to me is that these are already called supermassive black holes, and then you called one of them really big for a supermassive black hole. Like, are we running out of descriptive words for these things? It's a it's a, it's an extraordinarily <laughs> supermassive black hole, outrageously massive black hole, ridiculous black hole. Okay, I just want to make sure the mass of this black hole is ridiculous. So. <laughs> Whatever you feel like calling it, just sign it. So. Sorry, I just thought I should ask. Okay. Uh, if you give me a hundred bucks, I'll say it at a conference <laughs> so in front of everybody. So. You should totally do that. Do it. Hit me up on PayPal or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike, please save this segment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I did want to talk about another launch. Uh, this was just a sounding rocket, though, but this is something that NASA's been talking about for a while because it was supposed to create a really cool light show, and thankfully they finally were able to get it off and it paid off. So Good. let's go ahead and check out the footage of that. Four, three, two, one, teaser. Wow. So this was a NASA. <laughs> <laughs> This was a Terrier-improved Malamute sounding rocket. Just a small sounding rocket, but it successfully launched on Thursday, June 29th from the, the Wallops Flight facility, uh, facility in Virginia. And it reached an altitude of about 118 miles. So uh, with this, it, had, it deployed 10 soda can-sized canisters that were ejected and deployed blue, green, and red vapor that formed visible artificial clouds that had over 2,000 reports and photos of cloud sightings from areas as far north as New York and as far south as North Carolina. And uh, they even put up a bunch of uh, the submitted photos and stuff on their uh, Wallops Facebook page, which I'll post a link into the chat room and hopefully in our description as well. Um, but then uh, there was also some really cool pictures. I mean, I'm just uh, looping there that uh, uh, the, the, the footage, the short brief footage, which is also a time lapse, that, uh, that it took a lot longer to, uh, to actually see that. But... Um, yeah, I thought that this was really cool, and it was glad to, uh, to see it finally get off. And the whole point of this test was to see how uh, atoms can, uh, how, how they can detect different changes in the upper atmosphere really quickly and study a wider area than just uh, one particular area. So, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yes, yes, yes. Even Dada in the chat in the, in the chat room in the real room, wherever it is, I'm standing. Uh, <laughs> let out an audible "Wow" with that one uh, because that that really was yeah, spectacular. Yeah, that was facetious though for the tiny rocket taking off. I well, feel like. <laughs> okay. However, uh, no, if it I was, may, it was for how fast it went. How, yeah, it was how just fast it was gone. Oh, Sounding oh. rockets are awesome. <laughs> oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And then, oh, okay. um, are all sounding rockets named after breeds of dogs? No, that is just that particular. Like that is a program. sincere question. I really, I don't want that to sound stupid, but uh, so you no, were saying. No, no, that's a fair question. That's a fair question. For that particular program, they're named after dogs. Thank you for catching that. The <laughs> terrier and then Malamute, like uh -huh. an Alaskan Malamute. But there's other programs that like uh, continue on with like the whole um, Roman and Greek gods. Like there's the Nike and Ajax. Um, and several other sounding rockets like that. And then there's other sounding rockets that don't, you know, that just have like simple designations. So it's from program to program, they have their own different naming schemes. Native, okay. Native American. Or at least within NASA anyway. You look at the university projects and most of them have cool names for theirs. Right. So a lot of them have Native American <laughs> names too. Nike, Apache, Nike, uh, Tomahawk missiles was, was in that era. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice. Uh, yeah, I was like, wait, 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 what, what just did, what did the thing? That flipped me out for a second. Okay, it's good to know. Now we're all a pug rocket. Yeah, see, Marty the Martian's got the great idea right there in the chat room. A pug rocket. Pug rocket. I'm on board. Uh, anything that makes Jared laugh. Stage. I'll laugh at the yeah. launch. <laughs> right, <so>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and this story, this next story, which is going to be the, our closing out story, I think, uh, Jared is got to be very controversial, and I can't wait to hear what Ben has to say about this. It is a little controversial. And um, particularly right now, because Ben can't rebut. Yes. He so, has to be quiet in there. He does. So, 
He's Shut gonna, up, man. He, I was gonna so, say, he's going to walk up to the window. There's, there's no fan. Still can't hear him, though. It's too so, bad. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so give it to me. What do All we right, got? so 18 months later, these two guys right here, Mike Brown on the left and Constantine Batgian on the right, who are both astronomers at Caltech. It's been 18 months since they announced that, there's a, that they think that there is a very large planet, Planet 9, out in the outer solar system in the Kuiper Belt. Um, the results so far that are coming in are a bit inconclusive. Um, now, the current search area is based on this computer model that was ran, which looks at the orbits of Kuiper Belt objects, sees that some of them are in really weird orientations, but that it's not just some of them, there's actually a lot of them in that weird orientation, so there has to be something with a lot of gravity there to fling them or move them into these weird orbits that we see right here. Now, there's a study released by the University of Victoria in Canada that has shown but the results so far for the hunt for Planet Nine are a bit inconclusive. Um, so they found 800 new objects uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune, and several of them were in the orbits that were predicted by, uh, by the parameters if Planet Nine was there, but there were also several of them that were in parameters that were sort of saying, no, Planet Nine is not there. So um, a little bit of a weird uh, <laughs> result yeah. there. Some says yes, some say no. Um, some t you know, most of the time in science, when we do a study, we try to get it as clear as possible. But lo and behold, here's a study that's, I don't know which way it's leaning. Um, now, Bakian and mm. Brown are both saying that this study is a confirmation of their data regarding uh, Planet Nine's existence. And in fact, uh, Mike Brown, before he went on vacation on Twitter, he basically did what he called a disassembly of the paper um, that was written. Now, we have to wait until the fall to look for Planet Nine because the expected area of where it is in the sky right now is actually just below the constellation of Orion. So we have to wait for the Earth to move in its orbit around the sun so that we don't get the glare from the sun uh, as we are getting right now because the sun is very close to Orion in the sky um, at the moment. So got to wait for the fall, but they're going to look for more data and Brown is confident that they'll get it sometime in the next decade is what he said. So... <laughs> is it soon? Um, I don't know. Uh, do, you, do you feel 10 years is a is No, a I don't. But I know that each program has its own sort of timeline for things. I would say astro on an astronomical time scale, a decade <laughs> is a blip. So. Right, that's fair. Yeah, true. <laughs> Especially since these things, like their orbits, are hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, isn't isn't Neptune's orbit over two hundred years? Uh, Neptune is a hundred and sixty-two years, if I remember correctly. If I'm wrong, the Not internet will most years. certainly correct me in the comments. Uh, pl planet Pluto's orbit. There, I said it. I said it, Ben. Be happy. Um, it takes two hundred forty-eight years to go around uh, the sun, um, and uh, this. Uh, planet Nine is predicted to be 160 billion kilometers away at the moment, which is uh, which is just I can't even fathom that. That's a ridiculous amount of distance. Yeah, uh, there. is that even so. like getting close to like a thousand year orbit? Even if 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 it's even there, but I hope we do find it, and it's some sort yeah. of like ice giant or something with some really interesting moons. That yeah. would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, we need to get a mission to go there. So. But I think it's gonna take a little longer than a decade. Gotta to get find there, it first. So. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. All right, good. So uh, I, I, I think. Thank you, class. I think that's enough for today. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, uh, Ben and our live audience is gonna have an interview with Jim Kendrell. We're talking about he's the CEO of Vector Space Systems, where we're talking a bit, little bit more about the story of new space. A uh, little bit of history in new space and where it's going. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, if you thought landing on the moon was great, wait till you hear about what we did on Skylab. Skylab 2, we fix anything. I got a pitch and a roll program. Skylab is the first time that orbit becomes a destination. Also, it completely rewrote the book on solar physics. Holy cow, what have you? Skylab on its own changed the way we live on this planet. This was a new, a whole new frontier.
And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with this segment, I did give, want to give a shout out to the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, we are joined by Jim Cantrell, the CEO of Vector Space Systems. We actually had Jim on before on uh, Season 9, Episode episode 36. Uh, so if you want to go back and look at um, that interview talking about vector space systems and what some of you guys are doing, uh, head on back over for that one. But we actually are bringing you back uh, to talk about what we're calling uh, the History of Future Space, I think is going to be the name of this particular show. Um, and so we're looking at the new space industry because you've been in it for a very long time. And so going backwards, in your opinion, where does where does new space kind of start? Like, what's what's the starting line for new space? Good uh, question, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk about this. I think it's a history that needs to be be talked about. Um, so, one of the things people have a misnomer on is that small satellites are new. Let's just start there. Uh, if you go back to the very first satellites the U.S. launched, they were tiny. Sputnik was tiny, and uh, the the main reason they were small is because that's all we could really launch. Our rockets were, you know, less well developed back then than they are now. But of course, the technology in those satellites, in the case of Sputnik, just allowed it to beep when it went into orbit. And uh, I'll come back to that point in sort of the beginning of, the, of new space. There's sort of a uh, parallel to that. So as history went along, it was mainly a government-dominated uh, industry that, uh, that that ran for the next 20 years or so. Uh, from uh, 1957 to about, you know, probably maybe over 30 years. So in the uh, mid-80s, there was something that was called the, uh, the getaway special that uh, some of you may remember. It was, a, it was a canister that was flown on the shuttle uh, that allowed student experiments to run. And uh, most people don't know the real history of that. Uh, it was begun by a guy named Gil Moore, who uh, Gil's a personal friend of mine and one of my early mentors, and he uh, originally was a spokesman for Thiokol, uh, who made the space shuttle boosters. And uh, Gil was always uh, recognizable by a patch over his eye. Mm. And uh, he, the, the mystery was we always claimed that he had lost that patch during a V2 accident in New Mexico. Uh, the reality was it was something like a screen door that when he was a kid. But uh, Gil was uh, a big believer in students having access to space, and he put his own personal money into the getaway special containers and, and got those funded. He got NASA to volunteer that space on the shuttle. And so each one of these, these getaway special containers that were about the size of a kitchen trash can, uh, you know, were sealed so that if something went wrong, it didn't threaten the shuttle. And that was uh, sort, of, sort of the whole idea behind it was we won't have to put all this extra quality control in that into student payloads. And a lot of them did fail. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the whole idea here was to let students experiment. So that went on for a number of years. It really got its first start at Utah State University, up in, uh, which was nearby where the shuttle boosters were being built and where, uh, where Gil had lived. And then uh, about 1986, uh, there was something called NUSAT that was developed. NUSAT was a, the first uh, satellite that was launched out of the Getaway Special Container. And so this is starting to sound a little bit like today's um, new space, but it went back really to sort of the capability of uh, the original Sputnik, which was just a, a radio beacon. And so all this was was to calibrate FAA radars. It was a very simple student-built satellite built at Utah State University and uh, launched out of the uh, the getaway special container. So this was uh, uh, really sort of a, an awakening for a lot of people that, you know, if you go back to that time, you know, the shuttle was a national program. The, the Air Force had its own versions of shuttles. We had classified astronauts. This is not something that students could normally have access to. And uh, so through, through Gill's persistence, that, that came to be. So that, that launched what became the, the modern small satellite industry. And uh, that, that we know where that's all gone. And the small satellite conference literally grew out of, out of that initial uh, getaway special activity. Over time, particularly after the Challenger, uh, uh, accident in, in 86, the, uh, the getaway specials flew less and less. They, they flew that, that demand off, but it became more and more of an issue of how you develop satellites. So about the same time uh, that, that the shuttle blew up in, in 86 with Challenger, and 
the, the U.S. really lost most of its ability to launch anything into space. And this was about the time I was in college. And uh, I, I really never wanted to get into the space industry, to be honest with you. I was uh, The only thing I've ever known I wanted to do in my life was to race cars. And so I figured get a mechanical engineering degree, go to work for the car companies and, and do something like that. Well, one day I was walking down the hall, uh, Utah State, which is another random school I never imagined. I had no connection with Utah, but I ended up there. Uh, saw this poster and it said, help us design a Mars rover for, for uh, NASA. And uh, that was intriguing. I, of course, was a big space fan. I, you know, I watched Ben Walker on the moon when I was a young kid and uh, was a big fan of the space shuttle and so forth. So, you know, to me, this was like putting a car on Mars and it was the perfect combination of these two things. So uh, I went and uh, talked to the, the professor who was doing that. His name was Frank Red, and he was a retired colonel from the Air Force. He ran the uh, Air Force sh shuttle program for a while and I retired back to Utah and, and wanted to teach kids. And again, like Gil, in fact, he joined up with Gilmore, uh, you know, he, he wanted to get students involved. So he convinced NASA to, to create this uh, program where they were funding students to do these design activities, part of this sort of early STEM efforts. And so uh, in our particular case, we got designing this rover and uh, uh, we did such a good job. We got, we got to go back to NASA and present it to them. And, you know, when you're in college and that sort of thing happens, this, this is a big deal to you, right? We even got to see President Reagan at the time. Uh, as a result of that, I got a job at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and uh, you sort of fast forward to that time, there was not a lot flying, and this was one of the most exciting things going on. Well, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they were working with uh, uh, the Soviets and the French sort of peripherally, trying to get some of the international cooperation going on Mars programs, and uh, the U.S. wasn't nearly as dominant on Mars back then as it is now. Uh, there was a, a group headed by the Planetary Society and Lou Friedman, uh, and just for a little history, this, the Planetary Society was started in about 1982 by Carl Sagan, who I'm assuming most of you know who he was. If not, look it up. He's a great man and an astronomer and did the show Cosmos, which me as a child, I watched that and it was, it was fantastic. So he, he and, and Lou Friedman and uh, Bruce Murray, who was a former JPL director, started it to to have citizen advocacy of space. Their, their frustration was that NASA wasn't doing what NASA should be doing, and they wanted to advocate for the right priorities in spending. So, so they also, at the time, were doing something very controversial, which is advocating a joint mission to Mars with the Soviet Union. And you know, most people that are around today have probably forgot how, how the Soviet Union was viewed back then, but they were literally called the evil empire. They were, they were assumed to, to nuke us at any one moment. And so this was a very bold thing for Lou to want to do. Well, there was, there was really no government support for that, but we unofficially started working with the, uh, the Soviets and the French, and uh, this mission to Mars, which at the time was Mars 94, uh, was uh, something where the French were building a balloon. And so the, 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 the first uh, real new space effort uh, following NUSAT, which was all done with donations, was, was uh, the Planetary Society involvement in Mars 94. So because NASA wouldn't support it, uh, we actually put together citizen funding to send me and some others over to France. I worked in, in the French Space Agency for about two and a half years working on this international Mars mission. And it was certainly something that wasn't sanctioned by the government. And I later became considered somewhat of a persona non grata for doing such a thing, that working with the Soviets and the French. Uh, but this was citizen-funded space. And, you know, the, the citizens ate it up. And, you know, I... I always imagined, you know, the, the, these folks who were retired sending in, you know, twenty five hundred dollars, you know, and we were very mindful of, you know, that this was their money, and uh, it wasn't something that was coming from a large S, but it was, you know, somebody's money out of their pocket. So we, we took that very seriously, and we we returned to them a story that they were feeling like they were a part of, and uh, so so this idea that citizens could actually pay for and do something in space really originated there. Now, commercial space existed at this time, but it was it was more the, the the larger scale communication systems and geostationary orbit things like that. These are hundreds of millions of dollars kinds of systems. Uh, so what we're talking about here is where people can gather hundreds of thousands of dollars and do something impactful. So after the uh, Soviet Union fell apart, um, I came back to the U.S. because the the, the whole program fell apart. 
and the French balloon didn't make it on the, the eventual mission. But um, what uh, what happened then was sort of another accident of history that that really folded into new space, and that was the Soviet Union now had all these spare ICBMs that they had had really taken out through treaties. There was the START treaties that we negotiated, and uh, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, talent, scientific and engineering talent, that was uh, that was available. And uh, the the North Koreans and the Iranians were also interested in this. So I ended up going back to the to the Russians uh, into Russia with with U.S. Uh, intelligence money to help these guys be employed. And so I spent a number of years over there helping convert these ICBMs to satellite launchers to employ these folks to uh, keep them from going to the highest bidder in the Middle East. And uh, this inadvertently created a, a very inexpensive launch capability. So you, at this point, you started to see what I call the first wave of new space, which which started to happen uh, in, in the mid-1990s. And uh, there was there were three or four imaging companies that formed uh, Earthwatch. Uh, uh, really, Digital Globe now is the one that kind of came out of you know three or four of them that came from that. And, and many of those launched on these early Russian rockets that were converted ICBMs. And uh, here we're talking about you know replacing. This is a radical thing for the time. Think about replacing these billion dollar spy satellites with satellites that these guys were literally building in their garage for tens of millions of dollars. Now, that seems like a lot of money compared to today's new space, but recognize this was that order of magnitude reduction. These were people that were going out and raising this capital from venture capitalists and banks and other investors, and eventually it paid off, it consolidated. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of other uh, companies that formed in that period. It was a bit of a, a, a reflection of the Internet bubble that was happening at the same time towards the late 90s. Uh, what, what started to happen was once a few of these successes occurred, uh, others piled on. So, so others being, uh, you know, for example, there were some networks of, uh, of communication satellites. There was one company that wanted to put up 300 communication satellites that each weighed 3,000 kilograms. And this was only going to require something on the order of $20 billion to do. And so then there was a, a whole attendant launch uh, industry that came along to try and support this because of this, this coming wave of launch requirements. And then Iridium was probably the only one that actually made it through that. And that was a multi-billion dollar investment that literally bankrupt Motorola. So at the end of the day, you had companies like Beal Aerospace who rose out of, out of nothing in, uh, in West Texas. Uh, and, and Andrew Beal was a banker uh, back then who uh, saw this as a, as a great opportunity. This, this starts to sound like new space today, right? So he saw this as a great opportunity uh, to make money by building the launcher. So he was the first one to really attempt a, a large-scale launch vehicle like SpaceX. And, uh, in fact, he's the one that built the, what's now SpaceX's uh, test facility out in, near Waco, yeah, in McGregor, Texas, specifically. And uh, so, so he lost something on the order of $100 million. When he ran out of money, he quit building the launch vehicle. And uh, so, so this entire first sort of version of new space collapsed with the exception of a few of the imaging companies, which are now really core commercial suppliers of commercial imagery that have replaced the, uh, the spy satellite uh, imagery for the most part in the U.S. So they were competing at the time with some others in, in foreign countries like, like Spot. So still this was not uh, where it is today. We're still talking about capital requirements that are on the scale of a billion dollars. So those kind of capital requirements were so large that people weren't willing to take risks. And so that's why the first bubble collapsed and exploded. And about that same time, um, I got a phone call from uh, Elon Musk, and he was looking to uh, show that humanity could be a multi-planetary species, as he explained to me. And uh, he knew I had this experience with the Russian rockets. That's why he called me, because he knew he couldn't afford a U.S. rocket at the time. You could buy a Nepper for something on the order of $4 million, a, a rocket, and you could go uh, to the U.S. The Delta II was running about $75 million. So he looked at that and said, well, I can afford a Russian rocket. I can't afford a U.S. rocket. For $20, $30 million, I could probably send something to Mars. So we convinced him, rather than his original idea, to send mice to Mars, uh, which is what he came to us with. Uh, John Garvey, who's one of Vector's founders, and I convinced him to do a lander on Mars and do a growth chamber showing the plant uh, going on, uh, growing on, on Martian CO2. Sounds a little bit like 
Andy Weir's movie, right? Uh, there's probably some DNA that crossed the boundary there. So and the, the reason uh, we thought we could do this was go back to the Planetary Society again during this, this bubble that was going on, this crazy internet bubble that was part of the money that was fueling it. There were all these internet billionaires who were, who were uh, making all this money on, on that new part of the uh, tech sector. They were spending it on space because they saw that as the next great investment boundary. And uh, there was a company called Idea Lab that was run by the Gross Brothers, and they had a, uh, they had a company that was going to send a commercial lander to the moon. Again, this is 2000, right? So these, these ideas haven't gone away. They keep coming back. And uh, it turns out that you know, it was just too capital expensive, and uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't finance it, and that, that company collapsed. The Planetary Society came in and picked up some of the pieces of this, and we put together uh, the first commercial uh, built solar sail mission called Cosmos One. And uh, we got some funding from the Arts and Entertainment Network picked up on some of the stuff that the Gross Brothers had funded prior to that. And we actually flew two of them out of, out of a Russian submarine, out of Murmansk. So we converted the SSN-18, which we took, literally had them take the warheads out and put our satellite in its place, flew them out of a submarine. And uh, both of the rockets turned out to explode as they got to orbit. But, you know, we proved that we could actually do something like this for several million dollars. It was about two and a half million dollars is all it took us to get that. So. So there was there was this hope that kept coming back, and people would see what we were trying to do, and they would uh, they would uh, you know keep keep trying, and, and Elon was probably the next one that really came in, and so at the time when uh, Elon wanted to do this mission to Mars, there was there was a lot of skepticism about whether or not anybody could really make this happen, and uh, that skepticism even ran deep in our team. Mike Griffin, who later became the NASA administrator, was one of the guys I recruited to join us. And uh, you know, Mike and I, uh, you know, would tease Elon when he when he said he wanted to build this rocket himself. We, you know, we said, "Hey, there's a whole graveyard of bodies ahead of you." And we're thinking of Andrew Beale and Roton Rocket, and you know, all these companies that came and went on this the supposed demand that was going to be there that never materialized. Um, so, so Elon, being the stubborn soul he was. You know, said uh, famously on our way back from Moscow, he said, no, no, guys, I have a spreadsheet, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're going to make this rocket ourselves. And, and you know, Mike and I looked at each other and we said, oh, you know, he's got a spreadsheet. Of course we can do this. <laughs> and as it, as it turned out, so these are all related things. John Garvey, um, who had helped us on Cosmos One, uh, he's an old Delta rocket guy. He had left because like the rest of us, we kind of couldn't stand working for large corporate uh, entities and all the, the lack of, of, of creativity that they have. And uh, we, we, we thought of ourselves as space cowboys. That's why we just got the hell out of the, out of the system. Uh, so John had been building rockets in his garage. He believed in this, this microsat market that was coming. He, he uh, was working with a guy named Bob Twiggs, who was another professor from Utah State, um, who invented the CubeSat. And uh, the CubeSat, I thought, was a toy when it first came out. I didn't believe in it. John believed in it. He looked at this and he, he said, this is, this is the future, guys. And, uh, you know, so, so he was trying to build this rocket. And he and uh, Tom Mueller, who later became the VP for propulsion with SpaceX, and Chris Thompson, who was their VP of operations, I think, and a couple of other early SpaceX guys, they were all early John Garvey guys. And uh, they were flying these things in the, in the desert with their own money. And, you know, John would take his Ford Explorer and pack a rocket in the back of it and truck it out to the, the desert and they'd fire it and it'd blow up. And then the next one would work, you know. So that's when Elon saw this, he, you know, he was inspired by it. And he, he said, uh, gee, with the right amount of money and the right amount of uh, uh, help, you know, in, in the enterprising uh, entrepreneurship, then, then we can really make this a real business. So he decided to start SpaceX. Uh, on the way back from uh, from Russia, based on our lack of ability to get rockets that we can negotiate with the Russians, it, w it wasn't that we couldn't buy the rockets, but they were so stubborn, and we knew that they were going to charge much more than that they were worth for Elon. He just got tired of dealing with the Russians. I couldn't really disagree with him, and uh, we even went to France to try to buy some space on an Ariane, and they were difficult as well. So it was pretty clear that you know if you wanted to do this crazy mission to Mars, we had to build a rocket ourselves. And so when we first started looking at it, uh, John and I told him to build a little rocket, uh, which is pretty much what Vector's doing today. And we jokingly call it the Falcon Zero. But as we looked at the market and so on, 
the Falcon 1 kind of evolved out of that, which was a bit larger. And we knew that there was a real market for that. And we were really looking at the Pegasus, the Orbital Science Pegasus market and stealing that from them at, you know, three or four million dollars a flight. So uh, at that point, uh, Elon put a, about ten million dollars in the bank and we formed SpaceX. And so uh, really SpaceX was kind of pivotal, I think, for the new space industry. At the time, we didn't see it. You know, at the time for John and me, we both looked at Elon literally as kind of another billionaire that would come and go. We didn't expect him to stay in the game. And that's why I eventually left. You know, I, I could see that he was passionate about something and I could see it wasn't what I was passionate about. And uh, so I did the calculation in my head. I had, I had a large portion of the company that was employee number two uh, that, that I could have walked away with had I stayed long enough. But I said, ah, this will be worth nothing. And I walked off and started my own uh, company about a year after this. John never joined up. He was, he was dedicated to this idea of the microsatellite launcher. And so uh, when I left, Gwen took over for me. They were successful at creating the Falcon 1 and creating a, a market for it. And, and there's, a, there's a misimpression out there that the Falcon 1 was never uh, a viable rocket. It actually was. It was a rocket that uh, had a lot of sales behind it. Uh, in fact, I was part of a team with Skybox Imaging later that we were trying to manifest ourselves on that. And uh, in fact, when we tried to sign the contract, it was when they terminated that product line and decided to put all their effort into the Falcon 9. So what was, what was very interesting and I think pivotal in SpaceX's history was the, the, the shuttle. And when the shuttle was finally, we had the final accident uh, on, on the shuttle returning from orbit, uh, it was pretty clear it needed to be retired. And once that decision had been made, now NASA was stuck really without a rocket of their own and stuck buying rides from the Russians. Yeah, on their Soyuz vehicles. So, so this whole business of the Russians and the U.S. being tied together really is at the core of this whole new space effort, strangely enough. And so when, when NASA decided to come out with a COTS contract and SpaceX won one of them, that was the lifeline SpaceX needed because SpaceX didn't, Elon didn't have enough money to build something like the Falcon 9 on his own. And we all knew that. That's why a lot of us left early on. As we looked at that, we said that's a three or four hundred million dollar kind of activity. And uh, you just you just can't do that with with the kind of investment money. As it turns out, in venture capital, you can raise about a hundred to two hundred million dollars for a space project. That's about it. If you go over that, you have to appeal to what I call a national sovereign fund. So Iridium, for example, uh, on Motorola, that was all self funded on Motorola's back, and it bankrupt them. Iridium Next, uh, which I helped out later, um, they had to go get national uh, bank uh, loans to make that happen. If you look at, at Falcon 9, that was developed really with the commercial cost program from NASA. So, so when you get into the $500 million range, that, that, that rule of capital is still really true. So what this, what this starts to show you is that, that you know, if you're going to be inventive and, and venture fun space stuff, which is really what new space is all about, the capital expenditures have to be low. And the lower they are, the more funding is going to attract and the, and the more risk people are going to be willing to take. So SpaceX, I think largely, I mean, they can be credited with a lot of things, but in my mind, the thing that they can be credited with the most is creating a safe environment for space investment. So Steve Jurvinson was one of the first guys to, to invest in SpaceX. And I've watched his interviews. I've talked to Steve. And, you know, the thing he'll tell you is the thing that impressed him the most about Elon. Here was a man that put hundreds of millions of dollars of his own money into a startup. And uh, nobody else would be doing that sort of thing. So that was good enough for Steve that he was willing to risk his money as well on that with him. So that was pretty key in getting SpaceX to the point where NASA would give him the COTS program. So, so SpaceX has been a gigantic success. I still maintain that their sole reason to be is to go to Mars and that they're doing this uh, by, by earning their way using commercial launches. They'll probably always be in the commercial launch business, but... You know, ultimately never forget that the only reason SpaceX went into business was really to build a rocket to go to Mars. And uh, so if you watch how they go, they eventually are taking their capacity off the market like they did with the Falcon 1. And, you know, the Falcon 9, the first ones that flew are quite different than the ones that are flying now. They're all different rockets. They're really a lot bigger. So the, their scale is to go bigger and bigger on these rockets. So it'll be interesting to watch how SpaceX evolves. So in, in terms of then the history of how things go, once when SpaceX was actually a success, 
suddenly you have investor interest, and it really started with Steve Jurvetson, uh, but then Bessemer Venture Partners started to step out. There were a few startups, uh, one of the more well-known ones was Skybox Imaging, who decided, these guys came out of the NRO and a few other places, and they decided that you know if, if uh, Digital Globe could do the same thing with, with spy satellites, then these guys could improve upon it even more. So their idea was to have a lot of these little cheap sats and fly a lot of them, get imagery that's refreshed more often and lower quality. And uh, so they managed to raise about $250 million and uh, ended up selling to Google for a hefty sum. And uh, that was a big success story. And that created a pylon on investors. So the story you start to see is a repeated refresh of you know, the, the, the successful investment by SpaceX and then the successful investment in Skybox. And then you have another wave of investments. So where we're at right now is waiting for those wave of investments to pay off. And uh, it's not, it's not uh, clear that all of those are going to pay off. Most of them probably will at some point. But uh, you know, there, there's this, this wait and see period now. And uh, that's where Vector came in was we started to see that the biggest risk had become being able to launch these satellites, which were being produced in massive numbers. So, but, <laughs> incredible story. Uh, going back a little bit, it seems like uh, a lot of the same ideas uh, that we had back in the 80s and 90s are being regurgitated now. They were failures back then simply because the timing wasn't right. Is the timing, uh, I'm kind of oversimplifying that a little bit. Is the timing right now then? Well, we don't know for sure. I think it is. I mean, I got back into the business and put a lot of my own money at risk personally because I think the timing's right. So, that's the best vote of confidence I can give you. I know there's a lot of investment dollars on the order of billions a year being put into this. You know, the, the thing that's different from now as opposed to 2000 to pick a year is really the scale of what's going on. So the scale in terms of the individual spacecraft, the scale of the money being spent is much, much lower and much smaller. And that's owed largely to micro technology. So back in 2000, when Elon called me, I picked it up on a, on a uh, Motorola StarTac phone, right? And so now sitting here in front of me is my Apple iPhone 7, which is really kind of the core of what's, what's going into space now. And so, so what's happened is this Moore's Law has finally cut up with space. And because the investors have come into it, now we've started to integrate uh, the, these, these advanced technologies at a much higher rate than the government ever did. The government's essentially... Your, your most risk adverse investor in space. That's really the right way to think of them. And uh, they're, they're, they're not going to be necessarily on the cutting edge of this technology anymore. It maybe was true in the 50s and 60s, but it's not true anymore. So, so you're right. The ideas are the same thing. The scale of things are different. And really the difference between SpaceX and Vector, for example, is the scale of what we're doing. You know, we're, we have a different economic model than they have. You know, they're trying to reach 20, maybe 30 launches a year because that's what they need to be cash flow positive and to, and to fly off their manifest. You know, we're, we're talking hundreds of launches at Vector because that changes the economic model. It's like airplanes or limited automobile manufacturing. There's no question we can make these rockets in those kind of quantities. You can look at similar weapon systems. You can look at automobiles. The real problem is can you actually fly them off that, that quickly? And uh, so that's the big challenge we see for, for getting that out. We've seen, you know, Planet, for example, out in San Francisco. You walk into their factory for their satellites; it's damn impressive. You know, they're they're building literally satellites by the hundreds, and uh, they just can't fly them by the hundreds very easily. So this is the next stage in in, in the problem uh, is to get these assets into space. And from Vector's point of view, we see that ultimately we have to be able to shortcut this whole hardware development issue, and and to get software which embodies really our ideas into space, we have to pre-develop that infrastructure. So it, it, right now it's as if we're, we're still in the period of time of the PC where you had to build your own PC to have one. And, uh, you know, in college, that, in graduate school, that's what I ended up doing. And uh, that's kind of where spacecraft are now. So we want to take it well past that to where it's a software problem that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you're going to find a whole lot more investors that will put money into that and take a, take a risk on some wacky idea that you might have that none of us are smart enough to think of right now. I think you just kind of blew past a, a very key point, which was, you know, Vector's talking about, I think you even tweeted saying, doing 100 plus launches per year. And to put that into perspective, that is more, that would be launching more than all of the other launches from every country and entity on the planet combined. 
right? So it's more than China, SpaceX, ULA, Roscosmos, ESA, all of them combined that Vector would be launching more than all of them in one year. And that is not a minor undertaking, right? I mean, it's not just the rocket, as you mentioned, it's the software, it's the ground systems. So how do you tackle something like that? Well, I've never been short on ambition and uh, my, my team is kind of in the same boat. Yeah, so, so you're right, that's our, that's our biggest challenge. And uh, we view the rocket, in our, in our case, it's a pretty simple rocket. It's as simple as you can make it. And the pressure fed, no pumps, things like that. So. So that, that's almost the easy part, and it's not easy, but it's almost the easy part. The real tough part is getting them out on the range. How do you get a, how, how do you actually find ranges that can work with you? So there's sort of this human element about, you know, this is the way we've always done it, and they're used to people stacking their launch vehicles up on the pad. In fact, one of the things we looked at early on was ask the question, why does it take so long to launch a rocket? And when you really break it down into the sequence of events, it's spending so much time on the pad. So so you had a you know brilliant sequence of of two SpaceX launches within uh, what 24 48 hours, and they're two, from two separate launch sites. But if you look at how SpaceX does their pad operations, and there's some common DNA between Vector and SpaceX, obviously, is they use mobile tells where they they come out, they assemble it near the pad, and they raise it. So so that's you know they're getting past this problem of spending so much time on the pad. That's our first thing is is you know we assemble these things at the factory, they arrive at the launch site, we integrate the payload, we don't let the payload folks spend, spend weeks out there on vacation farting around with the payload, you know, it's, it's you come, you get it done and we're going to launch it. And we've already proved that we can, you know, stand one of these up, fuel it and launch it in three hours. We did that on our first launch. And uh, so we expect to replicate that, that kind of operation at a launch site. Now, key to us is we need four and five launch sites. So. We have different access requirements for polar orbit, for lower inclination orbits, but we also know that we can't really do more than two a day at a given site. And because it's a smaller launch vehicle, it's a lot easier to work with. We have a smaller crew. We're like 45 feet tall in these launch vehicles as, as opposed to hundreds of feet tall with the bigger ones. So it's a, it's a completely different situation. You know, it's a difference between launching a, a, you know, a cruise ship and a, and a little small pleasure boat. It's just it's a fundamentally different problem. So that's part of how we make it easy, but we also, uh, you know, we'll keep the keep the launch crews at each of the site down to you know one set of launches a week, and we'll have to rotate those through a number of different sites. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, you know you're you're with SpaceX and you saw Elon's passion was sending humans to Mars, um, but your passion was different. So w where do your passion and his passion diverge? <laughs> Yeah, so we're, we're really quite different people, and uh, and so Elon has big ideas that that really are his passion, and uh, making those big big ideas happen is what he's all about, and he's very good at it. Uh, me, I just like to build things. So the the fact that uh, there's a great demand for it, and we can we can do this, and I get a lot of attention for it, is sort of uh, uh, secondary to the whole thing. Um, you know, for me, I the only thing I ever wanted to do in my life that I knew for sure was to race cars. And uh, to me, rockets and uh, space stuff was just a special version of, of building machines. So, uh, uh, you know, th that uh, Elon is uh, going to go to Mars. I wish him well. I, I have no desire to go to Mars. A uh, couple questions from the chat room. Uh, first one comes from Time Trader, which asks, uh, do you think there will be a golden age for aerospace engineers soon, just like during the Apollo days? Because as right now, I see many aerospace students switching into civil and mechanical. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, when I was in college in 1980s, we were asking the same question, and the answer is there's there's been really no golden age, but now I think there is to some extent. If you want to get involved, there's just not that many positions available for so many people because the essence of commercial space is you're doing a lot with small teams, and so if you can get into those teams, this is the best time I think to be here. I'm having more fun in my in my career now than I've had in in, in the 30 years I've been in the business. It's a little bit funny because you know you look at all those uh, aerospace companies trying to build rockets, the billionaires trying to build rockets, and you know you had even mentioned like the the graveyard of people in front of you, uh, the boneyard of people in front of you trying to do it, and yet here you are doing exactly that, right? Building a rocket and trying to go to space and launching it at an incredible cadence. Yeah, I, I haven't listened to my own advice at times, and <laughs> you know, so I'm I'm getting older, and uh, the thing I've learned in in my fifty some odd years is. You know, I tripped over a number of fortunes that were billion-dollar scale fortunes, including the Internet, which I never thought was going to work. So just because uh, something appears impossible in one decade 
or even one day compared to the next doesn't mean it always stays impossible. So I've learned to keep my eyes and, and my mind open to uh, the possibilities that we can really truly do things that we've otherwise convinced ourselves we can't. Uh, what about not using launch sites? So this uh, comment comes from Euro Neuropilot, which says, what do you think of the F-15 as a platform for small rocket launcher? And we can extend that to what um, Scaled Composites is doing with uh, Virgin Galactic and um, the other one, Strata Launch. Sure. And so I'll, you know, I'll fall back on my prior answer, which is I may be totally wrong on this, but I've never been a real fan of error launching for a number of reasons. Um, one, you know, there, there's uh, a human involved typically in that. And so you got a whole other safety realm, you know, with somebody strapped to a fully fueled rocket, it's a different different issue. It, it's energetically, it makes sense. It makes total sense on paper. It makes sense from a range point of view. There's a lot of things that make it a positive, but it just never seems to work out. And it's 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 like anything else when you when you actually start bolting things together and going into the field and flying them, they end up being a whole lot more difficult than they appear to be on the drawing board, so to speak. And I think air launch still falls into that category. Someday somebody will probably solve that problem, uh, but I just don't think it's there today. You know, I've worked with a number of these air launch systems, and it's just it's just a stream of apparently in, in, insolvable problems, you know, difficult sort of science projects, as I call them. And uh, think of a cryogenic a vehicle like ours, you know, hanging below an airplane going at a high speed, it's it's uh, got its own set of thermal issues and so on. So I think that's really what happens. What what needs to happen is we need to have better and more ranges out there and, and better, uh, a different business model, you know, with uh, autonomous rain, uh, flight termination systems and regulatory environments that make sense in, in light of the new technology. Well, we're starting to see AFTS, autonomous flight termination systems, are we not, right? I mean, the CAPE ranges, yeah, yes. we're, we're starting to see that. Yeah, SpaceX has been flying them. NASA developed one. We're developing one for our vehicle. We're going to probably borrow NASA's system for the first while. But, yeah, the, 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 the modern range is coming about. This is going to happen, and, and it's really being pushed by commercial. And uh, that's kind of my bigger message is, hey, you know, to, to NASA, uh, you know, they, they started their Space Council this this uh, restarted again this year, and that's great, and I'm, I'm glad for the attention to be on the Space Council, and I applaud the leadership for that. But commercial has its uh, place at the table, uh, which I didn't see at the Space Council. Um, and, you know, we, we are making innovations left and right that, that really NASA and DOD ought to be using. Uh, otherwise, we're happy to move on and move past them. But, uh, you know, the reality is that commercial's out here, and we're independent, and we're moving quickly. Hasn't commercial basically already moved past them? I mean, you, you look at what NASA's doing, and it's there's no recovery on space launch system. Uh, well, mean, it depends on how you compare it. Uh, you know, we're not we're not exploring the planets. The commercial doesn't have a rover on Mars. I mean, let, let's not minimize what NASA does very well. Let's not minimize what the DoD does very well. And uh, but it you know when NASA was launching Comsats out of the shuttle, that was a joke. So so there's an obvious partition. NASA doesn't make computers. They don't make iPhones. You know, so, so where that partition is, is really the question. And I think NASA moving out of the launch vehicle business is probably the right thing. I'm, I'm an open critic of SLS. I think it's a waste of money. I think it's a waste of uh, engineers' time. It's a, it's a great project to do, but let's be real, $2 billion a launch. And I, I don't remember what the launch cadence is, but it's something like one, once every two years. It's kind of a disgrace. Do you see, so let's just say that NASA continues down its current road and it, it doesn't adapt to commercial. Although I'm not sure that's a fair analysis because you look at COTS and all the other programs and they seem to be doing pretty good with that. But let's pretend for a moment that they don't. Um, or even the DOD. Do you see a time when commercial will uh, that uh, ex exceed what they're doing? Like sending their own rovers to Mars, uh, sending their own people to the moon into Mars. I mean, just doing incredible things that surpasses NASA. Absolutely, and I think that's that's really the bigger story here. Is if you look at the history of our country, in fact, you know the early explorers were obviously government-funded missions. You know, Columbus and so on. So, so, but it was the merchants that settled these shores. You know, my ancestors, as it turns out, came here in the early 1600s as merchants, coming to look for ways to make money and just not be subservient to the king. This is this is our human nature. Is we go out and do these things, whether or not the government's behind us really doesn't matter. And uh, as far as the government's concerned, you know, in the U.S. at least, the budget uh, deficit such a such a massive problem. It's beginning to impact, in a very real terms, the kinds of money that can be spent on research and development. So at some point, that's not getting better until somebody solves that. 
you know, NASA and the DOD are going to have to start asking themselves, do we want to spend more money on R&D that's already been done by the commercial world, or do we want to focus on our core mission, in the case of NASA, going to Mars, looking at the outer planets and, and understanding the cosmos and the Earth? And uh, to me, those are much more fundamental problems that these guys ought to be focusing on rather than jobs in Alabama for large rockets. It's, it's, it's the wrong application of NASA. NASA is not a jobs program. And, and this is what's killed, I think, NASA in terms of the public view. Nobody will say it, but I'll say it. You know, look, NASA is starting to be seen as just another bureaucracy. They were once all of, embodying all of our dreams for humanity when Buzz Aldrin and, and, and everybody else walked on the moon. I mean, those were, those were dreams that, that mankind's had for centuries, and they embodied it and they achieved it. Those were, those were the golden moments. But now, when you, when you start doing things like, you know, big rockets in Alabama, it's just a jobs program. It's no different than anybody else that's got their hand in your pocket. A uh, couple last questions. Uh, this one comes from Dwight1969, which is, uh, Alan Bean says the move forward is not always a straight line. Sometimes it goes sideways or even backwards. Do you agree with this assessment? <laughs> I don't know how you can't agree with that. Yeah, it's, uh, we're, you know, we make our, our ways backwards, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that commercial's the answer to everything. We're going to screw things up. Uh, <laughs> you know, we had a backward step in 2000, and, uh, you know, but that's the essence of, of things you never ever give up. That's one of the things I learned in racing. You know, if you spin off the track, you know, and, and you, you haven't rolled and killed the car, you get you get back on the track, you get back in the race, and uh, that's the thing we have to do. We have to keep our eye on the end goal, which is really, I mean, here's where I agree with Elon: is we do have to become a multiplanetary species, and we're doing this in little child step. But let's get going now. And if if it's the government, fine, but more than likely, it's going to be it's going to be the private citizen that that has that yearning to go out that makes it happen. You set up my next question beautifully for me, which comes from Dutta, asks, uh, do you get the same thrill from building and launching rockets as you did or do from racing cars? Yeah, actually I do. So, uh, you know, the, the, I go through this series of, of feelings when I race a car, uh, you know, before the race, I get into the, get into the safety equipment and it hurts. And then, you know, it's uncomfortable. I get into the car. And then I get out to the grid and I, I listen to the other cars going by and I, and I think, what in the hell am I doing this for? This is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. But then when the engine starts, I get ready to go out. I, nothing else is on my mind. I never feel so alive at that moment. And going through a rocket launch is the same thing. You're sitting there watching it. And as I'm the CEO and responsible for all our spending, our last rocket we did in May, I went through the same series of events just standing there. And once the thing took off and we could see it was going straight, it was a feeling of elation that was exactly the same. And, and if you haven't experienced it, you haven't really lived. I mean, it, it's truly feeling alive. All right. Our last question then uh, comes from Noah P. K. our last uh, viewer question at least, uh, which would be, what would you do afterward if vector space becomes successful and small sat launch becomes affordable and routine? Good question. I think I'll go back to my cars. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so before we go into break, we do have five general questions. I don't think we did this when you were on the air last time, so I think this will be the first time for you. Uh, these are five questions we ask every guest. Um, no right or wrong answers, just uh, whatever first comes to mind. Uh, and the first question is, uh, moon or Mars first? Mars first. Would you go? Uh, no. Ever? Just like, uh, no. Uh, no what, desire. When, so always here on Earth, right? Racing cars. Uh, I'm happy. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? 2030. When do you think humans will step foot on the moon again? 2050. And really? Interesting. Uh, why the moon after Mars? No reason to send humans back. And why? Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so the moon has a lot of resources, and there's reasons to send robotic vehicles there, but there's really no reason to send humans there that robotics can't do it. I'm, I'm one of the robotics guys in, in, the, in the humans versus robotics. But Mars is habitable, potentially, and that speaks to sending humanity out beyond Earth. So that's the reason to send humans there. Why space? Space is, is something that there's a practical side of it and there's a spiritual side of it. So the practical side is it gives us a vantage point that we can't get anywhere else. It's, it's like a mobile cell phone tower in the sky that you don't ever have to license. So there's things you can do there from a visibility point of view and an access point of view you can't do anywhere else. Spiritually, 
I think it speaks to sort of our origins. You know, we, we, depending on your religious beliefs or whatnot, you know, our origins come from the cosmos. And uh, I think there's something, some soft voice inside of us that calls us back to that journey out into space. There's something magical about it. There's a reason why these, these films like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey and all the other, the, the good sci-fi films, Star Trek, that draw us out. And uh, it's, it speaks to something deep in our DNA that, that we all have. Jim, it, it, absolutely incredible listening to the story of how all of this came to be. And I, I realize we only scratched the surface and did some broad strokes. Where, uh, if people wanted more information on this, where, where can they go for um, anything more? Well, nobody's really uh, written a body of information on this. I'm writing a book uh, calling it Space Cowboys, which I'm going to, it's, it's a little bit of a story of my life, but, uh, you know, as it, as it touched on all these things, it tells the story of new space. So hoping to have that out probably within six to nine months. Uh, certainly let us know. I'm sure that most of the viewers of tomorrow are going to want to pick that up. And how about uh, Vector Space Systems and yourself? Where can people find you and Vector online? Yeah, VectorSpaceSystems.com. You can read about me personally, JimCantrell.com, and it'll be almost all uh, race cars. <laughs> awesome. Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday yet again to come on the show. Absolutely fascinating Let's... topic. Thank you. Pleasure's uh, mine. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. They're our Escape Velocity patrons. We also have our Orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more. And of course, we've got our suborbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more. And everyone in the, that you just saw on the screen is going to get access to After Dark as soon as it's made available on demand. For more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. All right, uh, let's get started with some comments from last week's show, which was, uh, I have forgotten who we had on last week. It's Marshall Culpepper. Oh, that's right, that's right, uh, from Cubos. Cubos. Mm -hmm. Cubos. Cu Cu well, it's both. It's Cubos. Cubos. It's doing Cub the Cubo S. Cu Cubo S. Thank that you. Does, yeah. Th yeah. Th thank you, hologram. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first up. I am here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first comment comes actually off of tomorrow.tv from Ooh. John Eric Thompson. It's like, it's like two weeks in a row. Wow. Yeah, I think it's the same commenter, actually. Ah, uh, it could be. <laughs> People are visiting our that website. That would make more sense. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm not sure. So, John, if, it's, uh, if it is you, congratulations. And if it's not you... Uh, I apologize to whoever it was last week. Uh, says, it was great witnessing two launches from different coasts by SpaceX this past week. Eight launches so far and four more to go by the end of 2017 by SpaceX. This is an amazing time. And if you saw that launch calendar in the break, I believe you saw SpaceX launch coming up tomorrow, mm -hmm. which will be three launches in nine, in nine days, right? Nine mm -hmm. days? Yes, 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 nine yes. days. Yeah, as, as long as there's no holding that goes off tomorrow, then yeah, holy so I, cow. I believe, uh, and I could be mistaken, but I believe that will be the fastest pad turnaround. I think it's already the fastest pad turnaround in U.S. history, right? Because uh, if you look at Gemini, what was it, uh, 7 and 6A, was that correct? I think uh, their that's pad, the record. The pad turnaround was eight days, but the launch between was, was actually 11. But if you consider it that way, the static fire for... Falcon 9 already happened, which delays, if you could view that as like the, the pad was ready by date. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, whatever that comes out to, less than, less less than, than eight days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think this is the fastest pad turnaround. In, from launch to launch? From launch to launch on the same pad. Right. I think. Uh, in the U.S., certainly not the world, right? In yes. the world, I believe Soyuz holds that record at like 
an hour or something. It's ridiculous. Do you know what the record is? It, it, it's fast. Uh, do you know? Well, they've launched within within an hour of each other, but again, that was from two different pads. Yeah. I don't know what the quickest turnaround from the same pad that they've had before. I want to say fast. that... The, it's fast. An I hour is probably wrong. Uh, you, you're right. I, but it's fast. It's really fast. I want to say... Point in the, oh, go ahead, Mike. They, they can't At move. one point in the uh, um, in the 70s and 80s, they had multiple pads operational at Baikonur for Soyuz and Proton. And so they would be launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, but from separate pads within that complex. Mm. Um, so they did have that quick turnaround, although one of those pads is now in, in a little bit of disrepair right now. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, but they're, yeah, I don't know what the fastest turnaround they had is. Their train can't move a rocket onto the pad in an hour, so that's not a uh, that's not a reasonable number. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm certain an hour is almost certainly not right. But I, I want to say it was within 24 hours, though. I it was, I I, I want to say that from looking on Twitter and other places this week that there were two Soyuz launches that were within 24 hours from the same pad. Oh, so okay, so well there you that's go. That's a certainty. Okay, cool. So, well, there you I go. Thought it, I thought it was from two different pads, but I'm not sure how. I don't know either. Yeah. All right. Lots of uncertainty. We'll figure that it's out fast. later. It's fast. It <laughs> Let us know in fast. the comments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, next up. Yeah, somebody watching this after the fact is going to be like, you idiots. Seriously, <laughs> it's like this. You morons. <laughs> how could you have this show? <laughs> when uh, I posted on Reddit and right. no one listened. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, next comment comes. Shh, Reddit's here right now. Sorry, sorry. They can hear you. They can see you too. No, they can't. Okay, next comment comes off of YouTube. Oh, children. Children. Uh, from Arturus P. Says, uh, thank you so much for showing all the satellite countries of origin from the PSLV launch. This is the third satellite Lithuania has sent to space. The first one was with SpaceX. And with the actual science experiments this time, this makes me very happy for a tiny nation is contributing. Yeah, and actually it's really cool that there are more awesome. nations doing things in space, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we focus a lot on U.S. stuff, but that's simply because a lot of the stuff happens in the U.S. As more countries tend to do things, we try to focus on everyone that's doing cool things in space mm -hmm. so congratulations and yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're working on adding like I think Mike is adding uh, some incredible graphics and things to like to launch coverage and stuff and things it's all, it's all about the source material so don't thank me I mean That's ISRO true. put out those different images all I did was just to put them together and do a slideshow for you guys mm -hmm. I thought it was really cool that they that they had that and that certainly helped me to visualize so it's all about the source material so mm -hmm. it looks like ISRO is starting to do more and more stuff like that to kind of highlight all of these different individual launches since they're kind of the biggest uh, kind of having the biggest market with uh, the ride share right now um, and so, yeah, it's really cool. And kind of the next comic re relates to this as well. It really helped me to visualize which countries are launching what, and even just to have a small visualization of what that CubeSat or small satellite or microsat looked like was really cool. Well, take us into the next comment then. Oh, Boom. apparently you're Capcom now. Boom, new Capcom, ready to go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> completely unprepared. <laughs> Let's see if he's re ready. Go for it. All right. I believe in you. So this next comment comes off of YouTube. This is from ELV2S. And uh, they say, yay, first Slovak satellite. Uh, the way it came to be is an interesting story. You could do an interview with the guys who managed it. That is an interesting idea. We should look up who that is and uh, see if we can talk about some of these things. And actually, uh, along those same lines, if you ever have it, like interesting stories um, or you know someone who's doing inter something interesting in the space market who would, who would be a good interview on the show that can talk about and weave a good interesting story, please, Benjamin at TMRO.TV, absolutely, send them my way. I would love to get him on the show. I think we're currently booking late August at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, love to bring him on and, and keep guests coming on week after week. There's so much incredible stuff happening in the new space market, uh, not just with SpaceX and Blue Origin, but with like, oh, e not even uh, just All companies. The world. With, oh, yo, just entire, um, you know, uh, countries doing these things all around the world, like uh, the hologram said. <laughs> I love referring to you as the hologram. I don't know why. <laughs> That's um, all right. That's all right. Um, seriously, though, I love hearing about uh, European countries that are doing things in space that I'd never heard, you know, did, had no idea that they were involved in some way. Even with some of these things, it might be something small, but it's still getting involved and still doing cool things. So, yeah, I really like it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next up, Capcom. 
Uh, and somebody Bill in the Capcom. chat room uh, <laughs> clarify the ELVT. 2S uh, apparently stands for Elves to Space. Uh, correct us if we're wrong uh -oh. there. Uh, so, I mean, there's no real good way to know that out of that, so I yeah. can't blame you for that. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from CocoFan50. I almost said 55 for some reason. That's what? a new, new Giving name. him extra, extra five. Guess so. Uh, I like the Tomorrow crew, but y'all are wrong about going to the moon as a way to get to Mars. We have areas in the Arctic and Antarctic uh, that would be better to train at. Part of the upper atmosphere is useful for testing entry into the Martian atmosphere. And I just don't see anything about uh, about it, the moon. About, about the, moon? the moon that okay. would help. That would actually help, help us get to Mars. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think it's like um, baby steps is my kind of personal opinion. Just mm -hmm. using the... A couple advantages here. One, uh, you have a smaller gravity well off the moon, right? So if you launch from the moon to Mars, it's going to be easier if you're able to fuel your vehicle on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick is you have to have fuel production plants then on the moon, but we've got water, so we can create right. um, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, um, although not liquid methane. No. That's not going to be a creatable thing, so we might have to do some weird transporty things there. We could do that at Mars. We could do it, yeah, but can't do it from the so. moon, which makes the moon less of a desirable launching point. So that, that's part A, is the gravity well. Uh, but part B uh, is that, you, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so, yes, you can use places on the Earth, and you can f certainly figure out some of the human factors, but there, there's a lot of stuff that we still need to figure out. And you're right. Landing on the moon is not going to be anything like landing on Mars. But having us go into deeper space and having us go to some place that's a three-day journey out or you know, just something where we can still get back to them and we can still save their lives if something goes wrong, I think Apollo 13 is a prime example of that, uh, is better than just immediately, in my opinion, just immediately committing to going to Mars and going, okay, well, help us four years away. Um, so th there's something to be said for learning along the way. And Mars is incredible and ambitious, in my humble opinion, uh, we should use the, the moon as a place to kind of learn some of those uh, l those techniques for maintaining life, I guess, is really what it is, the, the life support systems. Yeah. Even though Mars has a, a, a very small atmosphere, I mean, it's going to be the exact same conditions of trying to keep a human alive on Mars as it is going to be on the moon. I mean, not exactly the same, but a lot, a lot of the, the practices and the techniques that we're going to have to use to keep humans alive at Mars, at least at first for the initial forts, so to speak, is the same as it is at, at, at the moon. And even though landing and, and doing orbital operations around the moon is not going to be the same as it is at Mars, it certainly is going to be much, much better practice for those who are going to be doing that, even if it's all going to be computer systems, but just making sure that we can actually do those sorts of operations with the spacecraft and landing systems to actually get humans there is going to be a lot better to, to practice that around the moon than it is here on earth however the commenter is right that there are a lot of good analogs here to, on the earth and i feel that we should be utilizing as many practices as we can to get ready totally agree we you know it, it's not uh, this or that um, you know talking about using the Antar the arctic and antarctic should all be used it's not the moon or all this it's not the moon or mars all of the things should be used on our path to Mars. And that's the other thing, is it's not Moon or Mars, it's which one first. And my argument is Moon first and then Mars, but we go to both. We don't go to the Moon and stop. We don't go to Mars and stop. You know, even if mm -hmm. we go to Mars first, I still think we should go to the Moon. There's something inspiring, very, very inspiring about being able to look up at night and go, there are people on that celestial body. You just don't have that same inspiration from Mars. You, you just don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's mostly, that's your point. Um, also, space, space Geek from the chat room did have an interesting comment, which is, uh, Ben, if we have humans on the moon producing things and building spacecraft, then we have humans producing methane. A uh, little sticky, outy, tonguey face. That's true. Uh, I mean, yes, but not at the volumes we're talking about here. Yeah, you can't just <laughs> hook up a person and say, can you please fuel the rocket for us? <laughs> here, have all this cheese and beer. <laughs> You know, that's not how that works. Oh, so. yeah. Have all this cheese and beer. Moon, oh moon cows. Moon, moon cows. cows. And we just need to bring a bunch of cows to the moon. Why didn't anyone think of this? Problem solved. Problem oh. solved. That's why you watch tomorrow. We're problem sol solvers. Everyone knows cows jump over the moon. You're Next welcome. comment this comes off of that. YouTube. I'm just going to keep going because otherwise we're going to be uh, stuck here forever. Smart please, move, please Capcom. Capcom. <clears throat> From F Cycles <laughs> says, uh, my problem with moon first is that we could end up with this idea that we will go to the moon to get some money back by mining it for Earth usage, 
which will either be guaranteed failure in that optic or environmental disaster somehow. Yeah, I mean, yes, it really needs to be, uh, we can't go to the moon and then go, okay, well, cool. We're gonna wait another fifty years before we do something. I mean, we can. That's how we got to. That's how we got that's stuck. How we in a pot, that's how we had a That's how we got orbit. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, thirty. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Sure. Um, yes, there is there is a danger of from a political standpoint of going or a, not even political, just a will to go standpoint of we make it to the moon. We have that euphoria of okay, we've done this big great thing. Now we can take a moment before we do the next big great thing. And, and I don't think we should take the moment. Um, we should do the big great thing and then do another big great thing and continue to do big great things. That's what makes humanity awesome is that we can do these big great things. That's a catch 22. How so? But, like That's not entirely fair, right? Because uh, earlier in the news, we were talking about different timelines of things, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, you, you can't just get to the moon and say, okay, and then next week we're landing on Mars. No. And then in two weeks we're going to be in Jupiter. That's fair. And that's another fair. month from now, we're going to be on planet Pluto. Uh, like, that's not going to be... <laughs> Thank you for saying planet Pluto. That was amazing. <laughs> that's just, that's not a fair way to look at it. You're, each, you're right. Each thing has its own kind of timeline, and so some things just take longer than others. You're not wrong. Uh, I, I did not choose my words carefully enough. Because uh, you make it sound like every year you get a new iPhone and every year you should be on a new planet. No, but we should, not... we should be making strides, we should be making concurrent strides to go to the moon yes. and Mars at the same time. Uh, and then once we've reached the moon, because I, I, if we were to do them concurrently, I think getting to the moon is easier than Mars. Once we reach the moon, we go, cool, we've done that, and then you figure out the colonization and you continue to iterate on that process. And once you've really got that honed, right, you, and all the while you're still working on your Mars stuff. You didn't slow down your Mars program. You don't delay your Mars program. You continue to work on the Mars program. And you use the things you learned from the moon program on Mars. Now, once you're done with that general moon program, you pick it up and you go, okay, well, how do we do this on Europa? How do we do this on Enceladus? How do we do this on the planet Pluto? Uh, what, we got th one of each of us in the show mm -hmm. doing I, that. Except I, for the hologram. The hologram. The hologram. So yeah, yeah, what the heck. Oh, you I, know, we haven't updated his database yet. He doesn't know it's a planet again. Ben, I think I would, do, I, I would go a step further and make getting to the moon a, por a, like a, a pit stop on the way to getting to Mars. So last week I, I made the analogy that going to the moon is the shuttle's equivalent of the approach and landing tests. Okay. So for Orion recently, they put a, a vehicle in the ocean and practiced recovering it f with a ship. Yep. That's the sort of thing that you have to do in order to be able to make your SLS work. Well, going to the moon is the sort of thing that you have to do in order to be able to make your Mars trip work. Maybe, right? There are but, arguments but if, that you can go Mars direct. But, but if you're going to separate them, sure, then you, you are going to stall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. You have that, to put them on the I same trajectory. You have to put them on the same path. You have to put them within the same goal. You have to put them on the same project. You have to put them, you know, whatever that you have to couple them in some way. Because yeah, if you if you separate them out, then yeah, you could lose track essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, Eamon actually has a very good argument, uh, which is not brought, uh, uh, often enough, I think, because um, what I'm saying is somewhat idealistic. Because he says. Where do you get all the cash? You need to base arguments on human ri uh, rights. Uh, uh, the conversation is not with space geeks, but with humanity. Who's paying for it? Who's paying for it is ultimately what it comes down to. Saying, hey, we should do Mars and Moon at the same time and go concurrently mm -hmm. is really easy to say when you don't have to foot the bill, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So not wrong, not a wrong argument, uh, which is part of the reason why you have to pick one. Uh, but then much like Dutta said, uh, you, you can't stop. So I, I could be I could be talked back into Mars first. I, I, I'm not. Look, I don't care. At the end of the day, as long as we're doing something. Well, someone earlier in the mm -hmm. chat room said, "Who's we?" And I think humanity. Right. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we we here on the set of tomorrow uh, are do, we don't get to dictate who we as humanity. Uh, you know how humanity chooses to do these things, but if we had our way, then, then you know that's our opinion. Uh, agree or disagree, and we that's tend totally to focus fine. A lot to do on NASA. Yeah, we, we tend have a tendency to focus a lot to too focus. on NASA and the American yeah. programs. NASA and, and, and yeah, I think that's where the, but that's where the money is, that, and that's that's who's who's spending it and doing things. 
I mean, not to and be at harsh. Least for now, the reality is, you know, for now, at least for the current administration, the plan is to do a type of moon first of creating, you know, a, a, a lunar ISS first to kind of be that stopping point. And I think that a problem that we, that we, a trap that we kind of fall into sometimes is disassociating the International Space Station from the Mars program. Mm -hmm. The ISS has been part of the most Mars program all along. I mean, the International Space Station, I mean, even Werner von Braun was talking about doing something like that before going to the Mars in the 1980s. And we've been learned a lot of how to keep humans alive in these long duration space flights as we've been pushing it and doing these year long operations. At this lunar space station, we want to do two year, even three year, four year operations, practice long duration space flights at that station to make sure that we can keep humans alive and understand as be best as we can what the effects on the human body are going to be. So I'm going to we challenge been wasting that the past 30 years. We haven't been wasting the past 30 years. It's all been a part of the program. And just in my personal opinion, I think that we should have an even one more stopping point in orbit around Mars, either at Phobos or Deimos or at another space station that we construct there before going all the way to the surface. But that's just my opinion. I, I think you and I need to have a good debate on that uh, as to the, uh, like what... Because if that, like Von Braun's vision of what station was going to be and what we built are not the same. Uh, oh, right? definitely not. I, definitely I mean, not. and station is nowhere near what he was envisioning for like a, a launching point to Mars. So, yeah, we are certainly learning things. I'm not saying we're not, but I, I think there's a pretty large gap between what was envisioned and what was built. So, anyhow. Absolutely. That, uh, it I just think, wasn't a complete waste, is my point. Oh, I, I, I don't ever want to give the uh, impression that I think it's a complete waste. Uh, that, that is not true. Um, I just, I, I don't think it has lived up to its potential. I think that is a better way of wording it. My feeling on the space station is that we could have done sure. incredible things. Uh, even that Skylab prompt, we'll get into that at a later time. All right, uh, I'm going to skip that other comment. Keep going. Uh, what, what, where, what, where are we here? Uh, we're at Jeremy <laughs> Oosterbon. All right, we'll end there. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, I, they're really similar. We can go through them really quickly. Yeah, let's, let's com can we combine them? Uh, sort of, okay, yeah. Okay, go. Uh, so, next two comments come off of YouTube. The first one is from Jeremy Oosterban, which Oosterban. I love that name, and if it's pronounced differently, I don't care. Uh, although I agree that we should go to the moon first, looking at how things are going, I actually think that we'll have people on Mars before we have people on the moon. Looking at how far SpaceX is compared to Blue Origin, I think it'll at least be close. There's also China, of course, but they're just recreating Apollo. We have no idea how far Blue Origin is. Mm -hmm. Straight up, we have no idea. Blue Origin could launch a lunar mission tomorrow and we'd be like, huh, I didn't see that coming, but I'm also not surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Right? Yes. I mean, we also have no idea how far along China is. Either. You're right. <laughs> exactly. True. I mean, to be fair. <laughs> There's a lot of unknown variables in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they let's, let's be honest. Blue Origin is going to tell everybody. Blue Origin is going to tell everybody by releasing their produced video of the recap of their trip. So is China. <laughs> they're going to produce. No, that's not. They're not going to. They're not going to release it. They're, that's going to be somebody's like. Uh, no, no, no. Phone, as long as China's cell phone video. No, no. As long as China's successful, we'll release hear it. all about it. Yeah, we'll hear all about it. Exactly. <laughs> Mike, you were One saying. One minute news clips. Yeah. yeah exactly. And and uh, <laughs> la uh, Lynn, let's do uh, Rocky Boulder's last. Uh, yeah. For also from YouTube, it says I'm sort of dumbfounded by this unanimous leaning towards Moon first. The de facto leader of the new space revolution, Elon Musk, is unwavering in his Mars first approach to both space evangelism and actual hardware deployment. Obviously, there's no shortage of enthusiasm or inspiration from that goal and if the moon's not a planet then uh then it doesn't fit the creed quote making humanitarian humanity a multi-planetary species or maybe a better way to ask the question is wh uh, what should our goal for human spaceflight be instead of what celestial body will humans likely set foot on next and yet spacex has announced a lunar mission Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? I was about to I mean, say it's a so, yeah. so, wait, 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 it's around the, the moon. the comments this week? <laughs> it's, it is, it, to be fair, it is around the moon, not on the moon. Yeah. But, uh, you know. It's that, not really a lunar mission, that's a Earth mission. No, no, it's space, going around like, the moon, it's still a lunar mission. It's in, it's in cislunar space, so <laughs> it, it counts. It, yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and you know, that's just the first thing that we've kind of seen in the, who, who knows what the actual plan is? I, I don't, I legitimately don't. So. On that note, I'd like to thank all of our ground support patrons as well before we head into the end of the show and After Dark. These are people who've contributed between one penny and two dollars and 49 cents. Every single penny absolutely helps on this show. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. That is our show this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. There is no show next week. We are taking next week off because 
we want a break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no legitimate reason. It's actually a five show week, uh, so we figured month. we bring it. Uh, oh, that would be a really intense week. Month. Five show month, so we're bringing it back down to four shows. That way, your wallets unpacked the same way. We're still going to do our roundtable on the space launch system at the end of the month because it is five shows. Uh, we'll also work on. I think we have to do a hangout this month as well because I think it's kind of all the promises. But mm -hmm. next week we're off. We're taking a breather. Uh, we'll join you in two weeks. Everyone watching live after dark is up next. Otherwise. See you guys in two weeks.